Electronic, a new show which focuses on electronica dance genres. House, electro, techno, drum and bass and dubstep. Our first guest is from Kent. He's been DJing since he was 16. He's released a number of records. He's the owner of a cutting edge label, Saved Records. It's Nick Franchuli. about how you got into this business and what kind of were, say, the um, catalysts and highlights to you, you know, to an yeah. international star that you I see one of us now. I was, um, I was quite lucky. I was, um, you know, one of them DJs that was breaking through with the whole bar culture because, right. you know, the early 90s, there was no bar shut at 11 o'clock and yeah. then it went on the club till 11, till 2. But I, I came through the sort of the late 90s and uh, there was a local club in my town called uh, Club Class, which right. was yeah. regular guests like Cold Cog, Shades of Rhythm, uh, John Digui, Sasha, you know, the, the sort of superstar DJs yeah. that were breaking through at the time and we used to go weekly and, uh, and I used to love it, you know, it was one of the things, I was in a band playing drums at the time and I was just getting into electronic music and I loved it and I, and I was like, I, I want to do this, I want to play, so I got my first set of decks and then uh, they started making mixtapes you know, Right, I remember them, yeah, good old tapes, tapes yeah. and, uh, and then I used to give it to a, uh, the, the club promoter called Serge, who now actually manages me. Right. And, uh, and I was so excited that I used to not write my name on the tape and just give it to him. And, and for about four or five weeks, he was trying to chase me down. And, and, and he was like, Look, do you want to come and do a gig for us? And it was a, it was a gig for the, uh, I think it was like their third birthday or something. It was uh, Boy George and, uh, and Pete Tong. And it was like, we we're going to put you on to warm up with him. Right. And then it just went from there, really. I think the person I've got to sort of say big up to is Andy Chatterley. He was right. the one that I first started working with and uh, Skylark yeah. stuff. And my friend Rob Cockerton um, said, Oh, let's go make a record in the studio. And I was like, oh, Okay. So I didn't have a clue what was going on. We went to this little studio in Greenwich where the actual Thames hit the studio window. It was like right. the water came up. And, it was, and I met Andy at the time, he was quite a hippie type bloke. He had like the long sort of hair. And, um, and then we made the record, and at the end of the day, at the end of the studio day, I was like, look, let's come back and do some more stuff together. And we became doing the Skylark stuff, and he was teaching me a lot of the ways how to work in the studio. And, good look the front of yeah, and, and, and he did teach me everything I need to, needed to know. You know, he's the most chilled out person I've ever met. And I learned a lot from him, and then we went on to the Skylark stuff, the Buick Project stuff, and then the Nick Fantuni stuff, you know, and I started doing the solo stuff because everything I learned of him was, you know. You felt confident. Yeah, and he, and he was, you know, he was a big uh, inspiration to what I did, and you know, he's gone on now to do, like, you know, well, he was more always on the pop stuff, and he started doing stuff with Kylie now, and the Arena Palais, and yeah, so big up to Andy. You then gone on to start your own record label. Yeah. So, I mean, was that just out of you wanted to put your own stuff out, or did you? Well, when you started, did you start with well? I saw some with this guy and this guy. It was a funny story, this whole same thing, because I obviously started with Andy um, when we were working quite closely together. And it was about putting our, our productions out originally. Right. And then we started getting so many great records through that I was playing out my sets. And, and I started signing them and putting out. We played our first audio fly record back right. in the day right. and, and, and a few other bits and pieces. And then I did the, the One Plus One tour with James and Bela and totally took my off the ball thinking that the record label can run itself. Like, it can't. Because I spent a year on the road with James and totally ignored Save. And I came back and they were like, the sales are really bad, there's no profile, and no one really knows what you're putting out because you're, you're, you're signing records and, and putting them out so late that it's not relevant to the time that you right. signed it. Yeah. You know, and I've said this to everyone, I made a big mistake and I hope a lot of people can learn from that because you can't just set a label up and just sign stuff and put it out like six months down the line. You've got to sign a record, yeah, work yeah. with the artist. And then I came back after that tour and I spent a year, I didn't do a compilation, I didn't do, I didn't write music for a year. I just right. put some records on the Yeah, yeah. And, and then the year after I started writing again and it became really positive, you know. My favourite saying is, uh, you know, music has just become an expensive business card. Right, right, yeah. And it has, yeah. it's become an expensive business card because we make music, we don't make it to make money, we make it 
be your profile nowadays. Yeah, it's, 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 it's totally different, you know. It's one of the days where you could, when I was working in a record shop, I could sell like, you know, 5,000 units of uh, Starbucks. Something, or a record like that, or a Joey Buck from Energy Flash, or, you know, real stuff, great records. But now you just, you can't do it. So you make, make with music to be passionate, but at the same time, as a business card, so people know what you're doing. Transition there, is that where you felt I think comfortable? We, we always never really played like garbage, garbage did be, it was always. Mm. So it's a bit darker, isn't it? Darker. I'm the best in the plane in any way. Today's the day, but they've been paying up on the way. I'm the head of state setting it straight. On the level, I'll eliminate anyone who's getting my way now. Nah. I think, as MCs, we have something to say. And I think, with the utmost respect to Garage as a scene, I think it was more catering for um, crowd participation and energy. Like, totally. They wanted energy from the MCs, whereas we kind of wanted to say something and we always felt that we had a message. And um, we wanted to use the UK style of music to do it, but it wasn't until like we started getting older, like, or we started making grime that we felt this is something that actually comes to what we're doing. Like, 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 so, you, you, did you sing first or were you writing and you be saying your first like MC? I think it was MC for me. I started out in jungle, like, with Ton and that as a right, youngster right, in Manchester. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I started out in the jungle scene, but I mean, it came later on where I think. We all went and did our bit about learning how to make beats, how to structure and yeah, how we wanted our, our sound to sound. I think, I think it was like the transition from being like a live crew mm. to being a group who produced albums and songs. Mm. It was during that transition there that we all kind of came in and started being created together and, and making songs. Yeah, we realised that we had one direction yeah. to go there and you yeah. understood that. Yeah. So, I know that you're all MCs here, you know, there's another side of you there with, with the next man, there's a fourth man. Yeah, yeah. 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 MRK1. Yeah, big up. Yeah. Fuck dog producer. Uh, you have yeah. nothing, I mean, hearing the tracks there, some big, big tracks yeah. there, yeah. For virus, we have to trust, like, we've got to say MRK1, he's the top dog. So, so where we have our ideas, we'll bring them to Mark. We'll try and put them yeah, to the yeah, table, yeah. we'll try and do something together and he'll understand that with the beats we're trying to create, we're trying to put our rhymes to that before the beats even made. So it's kind of, it's just a good situation what yeah. not many people find themselves in. A lot of people like as MCs, they will find themselves relying on beats coming into them, trying to fit themselves around it. Whereas we've got everything in house, we can just work everything around yeah. how we want to do it. And at the same time, it's sort of reciprocated with Mark when he makes a beat. Even to us, it's like we'll, we'll take things to him and bring it to us, and, and between us, it's like when we do when we make five silica material, it's it's a collective effort. I knew I had a chip on my shoulder, never thought it would matter much when I got older. Mama wanna good boy, so that's why I showed up. This year you're gonna see the new single with five silica and banger. We've got a track coming out with, Mock, with Mowgli. He's a big, big track. Top billing, top billing from Finland. We've got a track coming out with them. Comic Kingdom. 
Starkey. Where's the from Philadelphia? Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're really, we're, br we're branching out, we're changing our sound at the moment. Yeah. It's not that we're changing our sound, we're just diversifying a little bit into... We're changing other sounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's real, it's real. Um, and yeah, we're, some of the stuff we've been working on is a little bit different to some of the stuff we put out, like, for example, the Breakout Trilogy, which we've released. Um, so you're not afraid to just swatch on and decide the thing, you know? Nah, definitely nah, nah. not anymore. I think now we've, we've all... There might have been more time. They might, not confident, but we're just more a bit more mature. We're, we're, we're into different music now. And we like different styles of music now. Whereas four four years ago, we might have been a little bit more tunnel tunnel vision about about our music. Yeah, like, we're still doing like the dubstep thing is still like a main priority for us. You know what I mean? We're still hammering the dubstep tracks out as well. It's like our core. Yeah, that's the core. Where we're yeah, from. Yeah, and then yeah. we're dropping these other things it's around that, which is. A bit different to explore, I mean, well. but, but we love it at the same time. Anything right now from crack to dope. <laughs> Originally from Canada, now a resident in Berlin, she's a well known techno DJ and producer. It's Radio One's in New Music We Trust, resident DJ, it's Heidi. Heidi. <laughs> Uh, yes, um, um, I'm from Canada originally. Uh, I lived in England for the last sort of 10 years. Um, and now I reside in Berlin. And I just uh, started a show last year on Radio 1 called Indian DJs We Trust. And I also. Very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I produce uh, sometimes and also DJ extensively around the globe. So, what does the average month hold for you? Um, well, this year's been really crazy. I've been touring non-stop. I've actually managed to DJ on every continent wow. on, the, on the planet this year, yes. Uh, a few of them, uh, some, multiple times. And uh, I've just been playing like crazy and seeing the world and so, um, actually seeing a lot of inside of clubs, but <laughs> not so much the world. Airports, that sort of thing. What um, do you use these days? I mean, there's like the whole mm -hmm. vinyl, CD, Laptop, I actually, at the moment, I'm only using CDs uh, because ah. I had my record stolen a little while ago, and it was really hard to to get them all back. Right. The thieving gypsies that they were. And plus, they're really heavy as well. Yeah, and also, it's not set up for vinyl anymore. Really, clubs aren't are prepared for people to play vinyl. It sounds really terrible, and decks are broken, and it just doesn't sound good. So, yeah. I'd rather use CDs and try and make it sound better. So how do you... Not that it sounds better, but it does sound better. <laughs> how do you describe your DJ style? Uh, well, definitely bouncy. Yeah, yeah. I would say very so. Very bouncy, uh, lots of... Lot, very groovy. Good party tunes as well. Yeah, quite quite housey uh, most of the time with a little bit of techno thrown in there for good measure. But yeah, that's sort of where I'm at at the moment. I've been playing lots of house, loads of old sort of Jack and Chicago stuff that I kind of grew up on. Okay, so what about your Radio One program? Like, what what do you kind of do on that? I showcase uh, a bunch of artists that maybe not everybody has heard before. That's uh, nice. Get guests on that, I mean, in the electronic world, I'm sure people know who they are, but in the grand scheme of things, most, well, most people who listen to Radio 1 have never heard any of these people or any of this music before. So you so. kind of bring me talent in as well? Yeah, it's like, you know, I get to play underground house and techno to a big audience. And, and you have fun as well. Yeah, and not a lot of people get, you know, like Pete Tong does his thing, and yeah. Annie does her thing, and everybody's got their own little uh, thing that they do. Yeah, and I kind of try and dig for a bit stuff that, yeah, dig, dig a bit deeper maybe, and and see what I can find for people to listen to. It's also pretty much what I'm playing in the club. Yeah. So it's, it's very so much my taste. It's totally 100% my my choices and my taste and my guests. So yeah, it's been really fun, and all the guests I've had this year have been amazing. What was the 
was the reason why you first got into like DJing? Because obviously being a girl, when you first like start going out, you know, it's all about buying clothes and, <laughs> and buying records are really expensive. So, you know, and you always look really hot, well, you, you know, so much. it's like records and clothes, you know, how does that I, work? Uh, I don't... Well, a lot of the music for years I didn't pay for because I worked. I ran Sonica Records in London. So yeah, I buy music now, which is sort of a pain. But uh, I don't know. I just got into it by accident. By accident? Yeah, I did. I was really into rock music. I still am, but okay, um, so that's your roots. Yeah, my roots is definitely indie, indie stuff and sort of space rock things like that. But yeah, it's like 1997. And I met Richie Houghton, we're from the same city, we became friends. The rest is history, basically. He opened my eyes to a whole other world out there, so I will have him to thank you for that. So you were living in London, mm -hmm. and now you're living in Berlin. So how do the two cities differ in terms of like music style and stuff like that? I have a lot of friends in Berlin, and I just really wanted to test another city out. You know, I have a European passport, and I just thought I lived in London for 10 years, and thought it was time to give something another try. regarded as a drum and bass innovator since. He's remixed to the likes of Fatboy Slim, Everything But The Girl and Dead Mouse and More. It's DJ Markey. <laughs> years old and 12 years old I start playing in clubs on real to real tapes then <clears throat> then well basically then I switched to turntables like years after um, I used to play like um, 80s music and early hip hop stuff then change to house play house for a long time then techno um, Stuff like Dave Angel and Noah um, Garnier, a lot of underground resistance, Detroit Techno. What do you mean to that day? What do you mean to that day, Pete? That the, the golden era, as we like to say, is like the 1992, you know, the hardcore. Yeah, yeah, then, yeah, then, then when I heard like the first hardcore tunes and, uh, and um, the Prodigy album yeah, yeah, uh, experience, yeah, yeah. that's when Big basically album. it's just changed my life. <laughs> When did, you, when did you decide that you was not just got DJ but you could bring something to the genre itself? Um, well, basically, I always, I always be a DJ, and um, well, XRS once he used to make a tunes and he used to go, to, he used to, he had the studio and just stay in the studio, and make tracks, and he just always said to me, oh, "I have to come down to the studio," and I said, "No, I don't want to make tracks. I think it's, it's not me." Then he said, and I said, you have to be a DJ. And he said, no, I don't want to be a DJ. <laughs> so one day I said, okay, uh, I go to the studio and he comes to play my night. And he said, okay, fine. Then we came to the studio, came to the studio, made a couple tracks. Rexha was okay, but nothing special. Then uh, when when I heard the Ed Rush Nothing Cool album, One Home, it's just yeah, changing. It. It. It's just change everything. Then we, we sit down. Uh, on the studio about like two after two o'clock afternoon a big sunshine and the lovely weather because you can see it's always lovely weather so we try to do like that kind of dark synthetic funk tune but nothing happened and i just like said you know what i think it's, it's better i'll go i'll go i go home it's better after me go home and we have to find our proper sounds and i came back home and the next day I came with the samples of LK. Right, and, uh, right. Then we did LK. And uh, yeah, the tune became massive. Then that's when I started working with Stamina. And, then, and yeah, I played in Newcastle and everybody was asking me to play East the Way. I was like, what is that tune? What is the tune? And when I play LK instrumental, everybody was singing East the Way. And then I said, wow, 
and um, I just phoned my manager. He said, "Take Linda to the studio and tell him to record the vocals." He recorded the, record the vocals. I just put on the top, no sound effects, nothing. That's it. Do you find the reception bigger in Brazil? I mean, like, you know, for your, to watch your music or do you find it? No, well, I think, well, I think, I think, okay, it's just, it's just like, like... Not just that, okay, I mean, your production in general. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I think, I think, okay, is, is, is the number one, you know? It's yeah, just yeah, like the number that. one tune, the rest of the tunes is just like, you know, I, I didn't sign it to any label or something like that. It's just, okay, it was the first tune we signed it. And, uh, and the two though is just like basically it's just like a, a bonus track on a V Brazil mm -hmm. uh, Brazil EP it's on a CD. Do you find that was what that was drum bass was missing though, that element of the live percussion, the, the more of the live feel, the more of the energetic feel about the rap, well, the darker side. It's cool, of course. I think today, these days, I think I don't know. For me it's just like it seems it seems like it seems like she to trancey, it's just like I, 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 it's just changing too much. It's too trancey. It's not too much fun and so influence. Do you think that's diversity, diversity base, or do you think that's just the way it's going at right now? I don't right know. Right well, well, the world police and German base like the funky stuff, you know, funky stuff. Even the jump up, it's got like the funky flame, It's got groove, and now it's just it's just different and. Uh, but I still got the tunes around. I play what I think is good, and uh, I'm, I'm with Spy all the time. So we're on the studio making album, and we do what we believe. Our next guest is a Swedish house DJ and producer. He comes from a family of musicians, and he produced his first track at the age of 15. The Picadol Records founder has just launched his new label and compilation album, both titled Mutants. It's John Darback. Now, as far as I'm aware, you've sort of got into DJ from a pretty early age. How old were you when you started DJing? Um, I started producing when I was 15. Um, yeah, I had my first record when I was 15. And then I started DJing around 19. So production was first? Yeah. That's, most people go the other way around. Yeah, well, I mean, my whole family, we're all music free, so. Of course, well, you've got Jasper as well, who's John's brother, who they do Hook and Pep, which is a production duo. Yeah. So you started producing at 15, what, what stuff did you produce on there then? Have you stayed on the same thing or have you... Um, no, I was I was doing more like deep house and um, gas influenced music and then I changed to uh, techno and now I'm more housey kind of thing. So were your parents and both musical as well? Yeah. Where it came from? Yeah, my, fa my father is... Um, in a jazz band and an old like progressive rock band and my mom is uh, cool. singing. Right, okay, so you can go a little bit of it. Oh yeah. Techno is a little bit different, so now you've got more of a housey vibe. Um, a lot of changes in the music industry recently, a lot of techno DJs are going a bit housier and people sort of, there's a certain sound around at the moment. Where's your sound at right now? Um, I mean, I like to, um, not only play house or techno, I mean, I always love to play all sort of electronic music when I'm playing. Yeah, same. Um, and I think everyone that does that at the moment, it's not clear genres anymore, it's more a mix. When did Picadol start off? Um, we started off in 2001, I believe, or uh, 2003. Maybe. Uh, but Piccolo is not actually working anymore. Um, I just gonna you know, start a new one uh, together with the factory called Newton. Yeah. Uh, I've been slow on Piccolo for a while and I decided to have a fresh start. So what's the new one? Uh, Newton. Newton. Are yeah. you doing that by yourself? Or? Yeah. Okay, so when can we expect that to come around and what sort of sound is that going to be? 
It's gonna be in the vibes of pick it all, you know, something uh, a bit different and you know, something has to be different with the music. It can't be uh, just uh, even though I love like tech house, but it can't be totally flat. It has to have something. The next upcoming months, I think even I remember that you've got an album coming out. Yeah, in uh, September. So I'm gonna, um, we're gonna do a few singles now, and uh, yeah, I mean I'm, I'm gonna go off to um, um, US in a couple of weeks, and then. Are you going to the Miami Music Conference? I'm not. No, I was supposed to go. I'm not going. Yet. Do you have you played there before? Because as far as I'm aware, there's not really much of a scope for electronic music. In like I have friends that have been like Matt Holby and people like that and there are little pockets but there's not really yeah. any, I mean do you have a following there or? I mean, it's starting to get more and more. I, I uh, have been in Miami playing, but not at the conference. And I think US is getting quite good now. Last time I was there in a couple of weeks ago, it was really good. But the album out September, is that, is that finished and done now? Uh, almost, yeah. Okay, so a bit of touring to promote the album? So. Yeah, it's gonna be... Uh, Summer's going to be busy with festivals and then I'm going to promote the album. So do you get any downtime at all or are you just studio all the time? I'm studio all the time, I guess. I, I love going there and I produce... Sometimes I just go and produce something for my iPod, you know, something ambient or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you ever use instruments or stuff or is it all for once? Yeah, yeah, pianos and guitars and drums. So what, what did you say you produced that? Um, well, I, I work in a, in, on a PC with Cubase and Cubase. Uh, but sometimes I go to my brother who is a pop producer and I record like real drums and pianos. Is this a different world to Jesper or is this Jesper? No, um, Jesper is my cousin and my brother is called Andreas and he's um, yeah, producing pop in Sweden. Oh, brilliant. definitely a musical family. from London. He has remixed the likes of The Prodigy, Dizzy Rascal, Dead Mouse and more. He released his self-titled debut album on Run Records, It's Sub Focus. Could be me. Where you first started, talk about the equipment that you used, what got you, in, got you yeah. excited as a drum and bass? Um, well, I started off in, um, in a band at school, I was playing bass, I was really into rock music. Um, from that, I sort of wanted to, I basically wanted to write the music in the band, but I couldn't really play instruments that well, so I started using some early music software. I had like an old Acorn computer, wow, which is like yeah. a terrible old like, <laughs> rubbish thing, and they used to use that for making tunes on it. Um, just like, it was just a hobby of mine for years basically, I've always been really into music um, from when I was sort of about 10 years old and um, yeah, it just developed into taking more seriously, sending demos out, um, got in touch with Andy C, um, started releasing records on Brown, um, obviously X-Ray came out. So that came out, then I got asked to remix the Prodigy for their greatest hits album on the remix of Smack My Bitch Up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, things have snowballed down, doing remixes um, and releasing a bunch of my singles over the years. Um, you know, sort of building up an underground for them. And then um, last year I released my debut album, which is also called Sub Focus. Yeah, Sub Focus. And um, yeah, I'm really, really happy with the way it's been received, man. It's been really nice. I was working on it for quite a long time, maybe two and a half, three years. So it's, it was quite a kind of... So it wasn't, yeah. So it wasn't like it just fell into it overnight, like you know, no, it's really it doesn't planned, really have to like, be yeah, yeah, No, it? I mean, I wanted to make it basically um, a mixture of the stuff that all of the stuff I'm into. So there's rock elements. There's yeah, sure. Like yeah. a lot of a lot of the stuff I do is kind of mixture of, of sort of lots of different influences from different types of electronic music. Mm -hmm. So 
Well, then it's not a very sort of purely genre based for sounding now. Right, okay. Aspects of like old jungles, dubstep, and electro, and it's, uh, sort of fidget house type stuff. There's all kinds of different stuff, and I try to all kind of mix it, mix all the stuff that I'm into together to put the album together. And, like, it, seem, it, that. it seems like there's been quite a few artists, including yourself, yeah. that have branched out, not just to be yeah. not into the genre. That was definitely side. like a goal of, of mine for the album because. Um, it just is creatively good for you doing lots of different stuff. Yeah, We've sure, been yeah. doing some like pop production recently, just right, to keep okay. things varied, you know, yeah, yeah, you yeah. can do. Keep things fresh. Yeah, exactly. Just do like, you know, write for some singer or, you know, be doing a bit of that. And yeah, it's, it's, Anyone it's, that you could name? It? Um, I've been working with a guy called Example. Um, right. He's a guy who's just had a top 10 yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ministry of Sam, uh, which is pretty cool. He's like a friend of mine, so. Uh, but yeah, I've had a few like interesting inquiries. I can't really sort of name any names. Oh, yeah. a big artist, so it's really uh, it's a real pleasure to get involved in that as well. You know, just sort of doing production with other artists. Um, and yeah, just I'm just trying to branch out as much as possible. We write a lot of dubstep lately. We write some house stuff. Just keep it very. So it takes a bit of the process of you actually writing your material as well. Um, yeah, I mean, at the moment I'm pretty much totally software based. I've got quite a few bits of hardware kit. Um, you use Cubase? Yeah, yeah, I use Cubase. Um, I use the main stuff I use, I use Cubase Massive, which is a popular synthesizer. Yeah, I love that sure. And um, I've done some uh, tutorials of that online actually, so right. I've that up on YouTube. Um, I use uh, Simple Zeta, uh, yeah, FM8, yeah. pretty much all the usual ones that everyone uses. So just like, I've selected a few that I use a lot. Um, but Massive seems to be the Yeah, favorite. that's kind of like the plugin that I use for like every track. Usually I've got about 10 of those running. Right. Um, and yeah, I mean it's... Do you I'm actually produce good. your own, uh, in, the, yeah. in the sense that like, not your own wax, but do yeah. you use wax and then add on to them? You know, as, uh, um, I don't use too many And then save own banks? Um, no, what I, what I do most of the time when I'm writing a tune, I'll kind of this is a good. I guess a good thing to talk about that like inspiration. Like I'll hear a sound in another track, for example, in a, a house track, and I work out how to make it, right. recreate the sound, and try and use it on one of my own tunes. Like um, Time Warp was uh, inspired by a techno track called Mouth to Mouth, right. which has a, a wicked rising sound in it, which is kind of like the hook of the track. So that's what I wanted to do with Time Warp, and that's how that started. Uh, Rocket, which was sort of. Um, First single from the album was uh, inspired by like the original band, the Dark Punk sample from oh, yeah. Rock. So I quite often get some. I hear samples and I actually remake them in the studio rather than using the sample. Actually, remake them, change them. And then sort of, well, did did uh, it? Was it? Is it a more of a process of like? So, but I mean, I, I start tuning loads of different ways. I mean, sometimes it's being made on the keyboard. Or, you know, it starts. In, it's hard to define like how you'd start a track. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing a, a live project as well, so I'm working on that at the moment. How is that? How do you mean um, live projects? Well, I'm going to be like, um, I'm sort of toying with the idea of doing a band thing, but now I'm thinking I might sort of do something more, more just about me with lots of technology. So I'm looking at like. Um, like cool MIDI controllers, things like that. Right, right, right. Uh, it was even looking like a bit more like Dead Mouse type thing. Really. Exactly, yeah, yeah. But trying to like perform sections of the songs, like, and I was looking at things like proximity sensors, which right, is yeah, really yeah. cool. Like, I would love it if you could get a kind of theremin style thing controlling the synth. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, theremin you control with your hands. Yeah, so yeah. I'm looking at trying to get it quite visual, quite like, like, about technology rather than. I feel it's a tricky one with my music because a lot of it's very synthetic. So like trying to get a band to play that. I feel it's like maybe a bit like it's a bit fake almost. You know, right, I want to try and sort of do it from a more technological. I think you can definitely do but, that with yourself, yeah. Yeah, no, it's exciting, man. I'm, I'm working at the moment and um, I'm only supporting Pendulum on their right, tour. Right, really? So yeah, it's cool, man. It's, it's quite daunting actually. My like four gigs is going to be at Wembley. Uh, Wembley Arena. Which Have you played there like, before? No, no, of course not. Uh, <laughs> had to ask, had to ask. I, I was getting confused, like, Wembley Stadium is like 100,000 capacity, this is like 10,000, but it's still fucking it's still big. big, and yeah, I'm really excited about it. Music. By the mid-90s, he was creating new sounds which revolutionised house music. 
which still inspires people today. He is the owner of Magnetic Recordings. It's DJ Sneak. Let's talk about the back of the box thing. I read about that, I really like the concept of that. Can you explain to the viewers what that would, how that whole thing came around and what it's about? Well, um, NRK was doing the compilation of Eddie, and it's all about uh, picking classics, house, well, yeah, it was mostly house, house, classics. house classics, back in the box, records that you know meant something to you, to yourself as a DJ, and that you want to share. So, yeah, yeah. Um, they asked me to do one, and I was like, cool. And they hit me back and it was like, it's actually a double CD. We wow. want you to mix both of them. So I got a big box to go back in. Right? Yeah, I think so I picked around 40 tracks to put it together. Wow. Like, literally like one, one, one day, one day, and then wow. back to back. You know? right. And I really enjoyed it. it was good. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just classy house music. And yeah. I um, reintroduced myself to a whole crowd and then pleased the crowd that I used to be to more. Did you find yourself digging something like, oh, uh, well, the whole thing was that since everybody was playing electro, yeah. I was playing 90s music, I was right. music, you know, yeah, they were like, oh man, I remember this record, I remember this, so kind of reinforced what I was pushing it. So, when did you actually start, do you, I remember some of your records on Strictly Rhythm, I think the first thing I picked to me was in 1992, when did you actually just start producing records, how long, um, how long have you been? Well, I bought my, my TR-909 drum machine in 1990. Right, ever since. I so 20 years, man. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's a legacy right there. Yeah, I was explaining to somebody today how I used to work with my 909 as my sequencer with a, with a Akai sampler. Right. And a 16 Mackie chime board and no computer, no compression, no tracks. Just pure Just doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, doing it. Excellent. Excellent. So yeah. how, how do you, what do you used to produce nowadays? How have you evolved from? The good old days of like pushing. I mean, I've learned to, I've learned to combine analog and you know, computers and all that stuff yeah. with what's going on now. I really, I use Cubase. I kind of got stuck in it, so it's a good platform. Yeah, yeah. And yeah I mean, and I've, I've been loyal to it for this series and changes. So I've sort of uh, it took me about three years to kind of get my swing in a computer. Right, I couldn't figure that. Right, when you're so used to like hands on with the iPod, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sometimes you have to really. So, I will make, often I will combine like my drum machine slide with right. the computer going at the same time, Excellent. so I will get a little bit of both. You've been around for 20 years, you, you keep it at the top of your game, you're consistently pushing quality stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. In the end, you're right, you know, people get an ear for it, recognize it. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've, I've, come, I've come from a different school and I, I, I've taken it very serious. And through all this time of being a DJ and being a producer and doing all this stuff, I, I've never forgotten the, the love. Yeah. The love has always been with me. It should and be the most important thing. Exactly. Right? Everything else has come and gone. Hair is gone. <laughs> older. You know, I can't stay up all night anymore. <laughs> things like that. But the, the love for the music and the respect for it. That's the drive. Keeps that's the drive. You know, this is why, like, Laurent Gini and certain DJs stuck to what they do best. Yeah. Because eventually, everybody comes back around to you. You know, and then you feel like, okay, your experience is cool. Now you're coming back to some music again. And that's yeah, great. fantastic. So, talking about old school, tell us a little bit about how you got into what you do. You know, what really turned you on to dance music and producing in the, in, in, you know, kind of listening to? Oh, uh, I mean. We talk about the beginning, man. I mean, I landed in Chicago in '83, right. and uh, around that time, house music was starting to develop and evolve. Yeah. So, Farley Jam, Fun, Marshall Jefferson, Donnas, Beach International, Tracks Records, all that was happening that was just around at the you. same time that I was there, man. And I was lucky to go to a shop and be like, yeah. Getting white labels for two ninety nine <laughs> from all these people that I don't know about, but the music was all similar. Everybody was trying to make house music, so I would just pick up whatever I found. It's just right time, you know? right place, right, right time. time. Right. So, could you put your finger on any one track or any two, you know, that you heard or any producer uh, at the time that just made you stop in your tracks and go? 
I mean, yeah, Steve, I Steve, I Steve Hurley, Jackie Bobby yeah, was yeah, one. Amazing track, yeah, unbelievable. That kind of opened the door, and then when I heard Marshall Jefferson House Music Anthem, then I knew, this is okay, this is something that I kind of like. It's a little bit into it. That's it for this edition of Electronic, but catch us next time for more music and more interviews. For more details and for full interviews of our guests, visit us at electronic.tv.